reasonably ask, why would anybody who obviously needs glasses get up to speak in front of a group of people and just wear eyeglass frames to demonstrate how we can, not only can, but will make assumptions. Um, and it's not just about things like whether or not I'm wearing glasses. Um, it could be about things that we've been told all our lives that were true, but actually ended up not being true. Um, right now, I'd like to see by a show of hands, and incidentally, raising your hand is not like this. It's like this, so I can see it. Uh, how many people have actually done um, one of those ancestry tests, like 23andMe? A few of you. I did the test last year. If you don't know what it is, um, you buy a kit, you provide a sample, you mail it off, uh, they do whatever it is they do, and they give you the test results in about four to six weeks. Now, I had been told all my life that I have Native American blood in me. So you can imagine my surprise when I got the test results and I found out that I don't have Native American blood in me. Pretty much everything I have is either English or German, which was no surprise. That I'd always known. But the Native American part I had always been told was true, but it's not. <laughs> now, I belabor this point about making assumptions because at some point in our lives, we either will encounter or more likely have encountered already people who are going through rough spots in their lives, whether it's because of uh, physical or mental illness, uh, the loss of a job and income and the uncertainty that goes with it, or the loss of a loved one. And while it's tempting to utter well-meaning but ultimately nonsense platitudes, the best thing to say is just nothing. Just be there and let your presence be enough for the person who is grieving. Or if you absolutely have to say something, then think before you say it. There's an old saying that goes, the wise man speaks because he has something to say. The fool speaks because he has to say something. Now some of the phrases we hear or maybe we've uttered ourselves are things like, um, I feel your pain or I know what you're going through just little things that we say to fill otherwise awkward silences. But here's the thing, until we actually go through what the other person is going through at the time, we can't really understand it. And even if we, when we do or have gone through it, we may have at best only a partial understanding of what's going on. I make no secret of the fact that I have suffered from depression and I make no apologies for having had it. This illness, and it is an illness, is not something that should be stigmatized, nor is it something that people should just be told to get over. I mean, think of how absurd it would be if you told somebody who just had a major heart attack to just get over that. And mental illness should not be any different. But even though I have had experience in dealing with depression, my maternal grandmother had something far worse than that. And they didn't have terms like uh, bipolar or manic depressive back then. But even if they had, it wouldn't have even begun to cover what she was going through. It went way beyond that and straight into seeing terrifying visions. At least I assume that's what it must have been like. I don't know. I haven't suffered that greatly, and I hope I never do. So even when we have gone through these things that others are going through, we still can't fully know what it's like because we each react differently to situations. The basics may be the same, but the details could vary greatly. And when the situation becomes so soul-crushing that few people, if anybody, know what it's like, then we must tread very carefully indeed. Now, this is what happened early on in the book of Job. Now we all know that um, Job was very rich. He had plenty of livestock, lots of land, and was blessed with ten children. Because of that, 
Some people think he might have had a place of prominence within the community, such as being a priest or a judge. So life was going as well as could be imagined for Job, and then suddenly everything was taken away. His livestock were carried off in raids, most of his servants were slaughtered, and all ten of his children perished. Oh yeah, and the one thing we didn't mention was that being afflicted with a painful skin disease. Now, I don't know about you, but having all of that happen more or less at once would be enough, I think, for me at least to say, okay, that's it. I'm done, God. Take me slowly or take me quickly, but just take me. I don't want to live anymore. But that's not what Job said. Not at first, anyway. In the scripture that John just read, Job's three friends had heard about the terrible disasters that had befallen him, and they came rushing to be at his side. As John mentioned, they tore their clothes and wailed loudly as befitting the customs of the time. And then for seven whole days, they sat in the dust with Job, just patiently waiting. You know, why did they wait so long? Well, because back then, the custom was that when you went to a house of mourning, you were not permitted to speak until the chief mourner spoke to you. But they were good friends. They just sat waiting patiently, waiting for the dam to burst and for Job to speak his mind. Now, if only they had left it there, well, we wouldn't have gotten the lively debate that takes up the bulk of the book of Job. Finally, though, Job couldn't stand it any longer. He curses the day he was born, wishing it would be forever blotted from history, telling God he wants to die, and other laments. Now that the silence has been broken at this point, his three friends suggest, tentatively at first, as if they're saying, uh, Job, don't be offended at what I'm about to say, but, and we all know how high of a success rate that phrase has, they suggest that since these disasters have befallen him, somewhere along the line, Job must have committed some great sin and that he was being punished as a result of that. The first friend suggests that Job was only pretending to understand how people felt and that since he has now been laid low and exposed for everybody to see, he must have sinned against God and therefore urges Job to repent and seek God's favor. A viewpoint to which the other two friends agree and which in and of itself is not bad advice. And then the second friend suggests in what all but the most insensitive people would consider a really heinous faux pas that Job's ten children died because they had sinned and thus brought their fate on themselves the old trick of blaming the victims, as if these ten children deserved to die when there was no evidence to suggest that they had done anything wrong. And if that weren't enough, the third friend says to Job that not only is he being punished for his sins, but that the punishment was far less than what he actually deserved, although what Job could what could be worse than what Job was going through at this point is rather hard to imagine. This is quite a turnaround, isn't it? Job's three friends, can you really call them friends at this point? Anyway, they went from offering genuine concern to offering accusations, which by the way is where we get the phrase Job's comforters, meaning people who don't com give comfort at all. All of their accusations and their debate points with Job are predicated on their collective assumption that God is just, he only punishes the wicked, and that therefore Job must have sinned greatly to be suffering as he is now. Job grows impatient with these responses, going so far as to say, very sarcastically, doubtless you are the people and wisdom will die with you. But I have a mind as well as you. I am not inferior to you. In the next chapter, he accuses them of lying to him, saying, You, however, smear me with your lies. 
You are worthless physicians, all of you. If only you would be altogether silent, for you that would be wisdom. Will you speak wickedly on God's behalf? Will you speak deceitfully for him? Could you deceive him as you might deceive a mortal? Now, after receiving such a blistering rebuke, cooler heads might have said, okay, you know what? Maybe we went a little too far here. Let's stop the accusations and go back to what we were doing. But that's not what happened. Job's friends became very offended when he rejected their advice and their wisdom, becoming more and more abusive. They doubled down on their belief that a just God only punishes the unjust. Job is being punished, therefore he must have sinned and should seek God's repentance as soon as possible. Job continues to maintain his innocence, but he eventually becomes so frightened that he questions God's justice, lamenting that the wicked people are prospering while the innocent people like himself are suffering. Job really wants to confront God and complain about this, but he's afraid because he does not know where or how to find him. This even though he mentions twice that he knows there is a redeemer or advocate up in heaven who will vouch for his innocence. Now to be fair to Job's friends, they weren't entirely wrong. It is true that suffering is a consequence of our sins and that we should seek God's favor and repent. The problem is that it didn't really apply in Job's case. In chapter 8, verse 6, Bildad says to Job, If you are pure and upright, surely then God will rouse himself for you. And in verse 20, he urges Job to be a blameless person. The problem is that we, the readers, have the benefit of knowing that in the first two chapters, all of this was a wager between God and Satan. Both of them considered Job to be blameless, although Satan was a little skeptical because of Job's wealth and position and prosperity. Now, God never admitted this or told Job that this was going to happen because if he had, if he had told Job this was a test, then it wouldn't have been a true test. And it might just have had the opposite effect of what God had intended. So finally, after all this lengthy back and forth between Job and his tormentors, I guess you could call them now, God finally puts an end to all of this in chapter 38 by speaking out of the whirlwind, saying directly to Job, who is this, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? He then proceeds to ask Job a series of questions that no human being could possibly answer. So Job finally did get his session with God, but not the way he was expecting. Instead of Job questioning God, it was the other way around. Finally, in the last chapter, Job admits that he had made incorrect assumptions about God, saying, I spoke of things I did not know, things too wonderful for me to understand. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. So, in an ironic twist, Job finally did repent, but not the way his friends wanted him to. Now, Job's response pleased God, as who, as we will remember, still considered Job to be blameless. But he was really annoyed with Job's three friends. God told them that because they had not spoken truly of him as Job had, they were to offer a sacrifice and Job would pray for them so that God's wrath would be averted. So they did as they were commanded. The three friends offered their sacrifice, Job interceded, and presumably they went back whence they came, having learned their lesson. But note this difference. They had had a lengthy theological debate 
with incomplete information and their own assumptions. But when they were confronted and corrected, Job humbled himself and accepted the correction about his assumptions willingly. Job's three friends were humiliated because they did not correct their assumptions until they were essentially forced to. There's a lesson for us in this. We make our assumptions about life, about God, about our place in the universe, about people we know, about people we don't know. Sometimes our assumptions are true, sometimes they're false. Job's friends went wrong in two ways. First of all, while they understood perfectly well about God's justice and the need for repentance, they did not understand at all about God's mercy and grace. And secondly, they assumed that Job was wicked because he was suffering at the hands of a just God, and their replies were more about condemnation than compassion. Job needed empathy. They offered advice instead. So my invitation for all of us is this. There are people all around us right now who might be going through hard times. They may be sitting in this congregation right now. As I've said before, silence is the best thing to say when someone is grieving. But if we absolutely must say something, we must think before we speak. Also, in that sea of people around us, there will be people whom we know very well indeed and people with whom we have in common only the fact that we're human. So when we see someone who's different from us, someone with a different skin color or a different ethnicity, someone who was born in another country, someone of a different social status, someone who's disabled, someone of the opposite sex or a different gender identity, someone with a different faith tradition or no faith tradition at all, someone on the opposite side of the aisle. If our assumptions about these people turn out to be false, then we should accept that correction with grace and humility. Our job is to love people. That's it. Instead of looking at people through the eyes of condemnation and fear, we should treat them the way we would want to be treated. We should look at them through the eyes of compassion and of real love. Because, as a woman named Susan Cottrell put it, real love dispels fear. And real love, real love, accepts people as they are with room for who they may become. Amen? And so that essentially is our discipleship commitment. Look at people through the eyes of compassion rather than of condemnation. And if our assumptions about people or situations are proved to be wrong, then we should accept that with the grace and humility it deserves. <clears throat> One thing to remember, though, if we are, since we are a broken people, we can be put back together. We can be raised up. Bear that in mind as we, as we stand as if we are able and sing our closing hymn, number 143, On Eagle's Wings. Thank you.